Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, and thank you all for joining us today for this uh, webinar. So uh, I am Himashri and I am a senior executive for science communications at the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance and for today's webinar I'll be your host. So today what we are bringing to you is the fifth lecture of a series of lectures by experts uh, named term the Continue Biotechnology Education Lecture Series. These lectures are organized by India Alliance in collaboration with Guru Angad Dev Veterinary and Animal Sciences University in short Gadwasu and IIT Roorkee. Our aim is to bring to you a diverse range of topics in biotechnology. So the first four lectures that uh, were on genetically engineered vaccines, next generation sequencing met uh, metagenomics, and uh, genome editing in animals for enhancing productivity. Or you can um, go to our YouTube channel, India Alliance YouTube channel, and uh, view these lectures. We put them uh, up uh, a month after we have these webinars. So you can access them there. So today we come to our uh, topic for the day, uh, which is structure assisted single molecule multi-targeting of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting topic. And uh, so before uh, we start with the uh, session, I'd like to again welcome all of you participants, mainly who have joined from Gadwasu, IIT Roorkee, and also from various institutes around the country. Uh, so before we start, we'd like to uh, quickly introduce you to the organization that I represent, uh, the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. So India Alliance is a charitable trust registered in India that funds research in health and biomedical sciences. So just like your DB DST, DBT, CSIR, we do fund research in India. But apart from investing in these transformative ideas, we also support research ecosystems to advance discovery and innovation to improve health and well-being. We are being funded by the Department of Biotechnology the government, from the Government of India and the Wellcome Trust in UK. Also, apart from funding research, we do fund and support various programs that promote uh, national and international collaborations, professional skill building workshops, and programs on strengthening research ecosystem. And we promote science education, awareness, and public engagement with science in India. So, uh, India Alliance periodically conducts such workshops, webinars, uh, science communication uh, workshops, as well as public engagement events, both offline and online throughout the year. To keep yourself updated on our fellowships, our research grants, the events and workshops, please follow um, uh, us on social media through handles that will be shown on screen. Abdul, can we show the um, social media handles? Yes, so you can see that we are available on uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, also YouTube and uh, LinkedIn. So you can follow us in the social on social media to understand about the programs that are coming up. Uh, now we dive uh, before we dive into the lecture, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, please uh, remain um, uh, aware that uh, the webinar is being recorded. Your videos and microphones will remain switched off during the event to avoid any distractions to the speaker. You can leave uh, your questions for the speakers anytime during the session in a question box. So if you look at the, the go to webinar being shown on your screen, you'll be able to see that there is a question box uh, being shown here. We can see the screen here and you can type your questions there. Also, there is a chat box. You can type your uh, queries uh, or any other chats like you can't hear, you, you are having trouble seeing the slides, then please put your chats there and we will access them and respond to you as soon as the session is over or during the session as, as need arises. Also, uh, let me uh, 
tell you that if you feel that uh, if you find the webinar ending abruptly due to any technical glitch please join back using the same registration link that you have used now also please note that we will be providing e certificates to all of you who attend the entire session and uh, share a short post workshop evaluation with us so the post workshop evaluation uh, will go to, once you exit the webinar you will receive that on your screen and you have to fill it out please uh, um, note that the certificates are uh, prepared manually uh, one by one and we send it to your email ids within uh, you know within one week or so uh, so if in case you do not receive it at max max uh, in 10 days you can write to us and we'll uh, look into the issue also we look forward uh, to your feedback of course and if you plan on sharing highlights from the workshop screenshots through your social media handles do feel free to tag us so next uh, slide we go to uh, today's uh, agenda we will uh, start with as we have already started with an introduction now we'll move on to uh, second we will move on to the welcome address uh, and then we'll start with the main session for today this is uh, by dr Sh shelley and then uh, we'll have a short question and answer break soon after and a five minute screen break to give you um, some uh, break from the uh, and then next we go to the funding opportunities available at India Alliance um, by one of our grants advisors. Uh, we will then close with the closing remarks. So uh, before, uh, uh, without further delay, I will now move on to Dr. Vishal Sharma who is here to give the um, welcome address today. So I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sharma and int briefly introduce him. Uh, so, Dr. Sharma is serving as an assistant professor at the College of Biotechnology, Guru Angad Dev uh, Veterinary and Animal Sciences University in Punjab. He has done his MVSC from uh, the Masters in uh, Veterinary Sciences from the Lala Lajpat Rai University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences and PhD from National Dairy Research Institute in Karnal. He was also the National Postdoctoral Fellow uh, from SERP, working on understanding the effect of cow milk derived uh, beta casomorphins on neuroblastoma cells functioning and in his implications on neural, neuronal disorders. So I, with this brief introduction, I'll now in, uh, invite Dr. Uh, Sharma to the screen for his welcome address. Over to you, Dr. Sharma. Hope you can, uh, yeah. Morning. I welcome you all on the behalf of DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, IIT Roorkee, and Garvasu in continuing biotechnology education lecture series. Today's lecture is the fifth lecture under the CBE series, and the topic of the lecture is Structure Assisted Single Molecule Multi Targeting of SARS CoV 2, and it will be delivered by Dr. Shali Kumar. Now I request Himashri to introduce the speaker and start the lecture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma. And now yeah. I'll uh, we'll go to the next, uh, you know, the first session of the day. So before I begin with the lecture on structure-assisted single molecule multi-targeting of SARS-CoV-2, let me introduce you to our uh, speaker, Dr. Shelley Tomer, on the screen. Dr. Tomer is a professor at the Department of Biosciences at IIT Roorkee. She has been uh, part of I, uh, that department since uh, um, last 15 years. Um, she has done her master's in biophysics from all uh, India Institute of Medical Sciences and her PhD at uh, Purdue University. Uh, uh, she has also uh, have hundreds of publications at high impact journals uh, and uh, have three patents she her research is on antiviral drug discovery infectious viral disease and this is her core area of research and today she will talk to you about uh, her uh, research area and what uh, she wants to talk about uh, structural biology related to uh, the sars cov2 virus so over to you, Dr. Uh, Tomar. Uh, you can now begin your lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Himashri, for uh, the introduction. I hope I'm audible now. Yes, Dr. Shad, you're audible. I will be sharing my presentation here. 
Yes, your presentation is up. Okay. So very uh, good morning to all the participants and the organizers. Uh, first of all, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, DBT Welcome Trust uh, Alliance, India Alliance, for giving this opportunity to uh, deliver. Uh, I'll be talking uh, very uh, initially. I'll be talking about very basic virology, structure biology, and then I will move into. Uh, the detail of the research or the topic. So the topic sounds not very interesting. So I'll try and make it interesting so that everyone who has joined is able to understand uh, what we do and why we do. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank Dr. Ishpal Singh Malik and also uh, Dr. Ratan Chaudhary who has helped me in, uh, you know, invited me and helped me in uh, delivering this lecture. So uh, I begin. So I will be. Uh, I on one side okay so today i'll be talking on structure assisted single molecule multi-targeting of SARS-CoV-2 so this is a new concept that we have come up for targeting uh, viruses so basically at IIT Rurki uh, my research group we work on infectious RNA viruses uh, before uh, this pandemic happened we were working on flaviviruses that is uh, dengue West Nile, and we were working on alpha viruses, that is chikungunya. So all these are RNA viruses, infectious. And with the uh, pandemic of Corona, we started working on, we have few projects uh, of, on Corona, and we are trying to identify and discover some antiviral molecules, uh, trying to do drug repurposing uh, for um, identifying antiviral molecules against RCOV2 as well as we are working on some uh, VLP based vaccines uh, for RNA viruses. So before I move into too much details of the research that we are doing, I will uh, be giving, this is not moving forward. Okay, so very brief introduction because most probably the participants here are from various fields and not virology or structure biology. So I would like to uh, first introduce a little bit uh, uh, virology as well as uh, structure biology. So when we talk about viruses, viruses, these are small sub-microscopic obligate intercellular parasites. This we already know, most of us. So these cannot replicate lying on table or chair on hand. So they actually require a host cell in which they can replicate and make many, many copies of itself. So viruses infect all life forms, including humans, plants, animals, also microorganisms. They infect bacteria, archaea. So uh, we find them everywhere. So they can be of different shapes and structures. And the genetic material which is present in these viruses can be DNA and RNA. And it can be double-stranded, single-stranded. RNA can also be double-stranded. And then it can be plus and minus polarity. So um, there's a lot of variation in the genetic material which is present in these uh, virus particles. So uh, just giving brief. Uh, so uh, we can talk about uh, animal viruses. So animal viruses, not all viruses are infectious, but many of these viruses, they do cause diseases in animals and plants. And obviously now we know um, humans also, uh, and they can lead to various epidemic and pandemic. So there are a lot of uh, plant viruses and they cause a lot of uh, plant related diseases. Uh, which leads to a lot of economic loss, as well as there are a uh, number of animal viruses like influenza, rabies, and nowadays in India, um, like in Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana, and UP, we are seeing this lumpy uh, uh, skin disease, especially in cows. Um, all these viruses, they are very pathogenic, and uh, they uh, can lead to loss of life in humans, as well as a lot of economic loss, agriculture sector. Um, if they uh, infect any of these animals which are there in the agriculture sector. So moving on to uh, how do these viruses look like? So these viruses, uh, if I look from the structural point of view, uh, they are beautiful. They are very diverse. So they have uh, very uh, different, if you look at the morphologies and structures, a lot of variation is there. So if we try to classify them, these viruses, uh, there are viruses which are helical viruses, for example, tobacco mosaic virus. 
so the genome is generally present inside and outside we have the protein which coats the genome uh, there are these polyhedral viruses very common ones are adenoviruses uh, which do cause uh, common illnesses in humans uh, related to uh, cold flu like symptoms so they have these polyhedrons this is like a icosahedral symmetry uh, which contains 20 triangle faces uh, equilateral triangles and then uh, all this you see on the surface is the uh, captured protein and inside you have the genome um, rna or dna depending on which virus it is then there are viruses which are spherical and um, inside they have in the sphere uh, the coat they have inside the nucleic acid some of these viruses which are called complex viruses they have very complex structure um, so uh, for example we have bacteriophages and these are the viruses which uh, actually infect and they kill bacteria um, and uh, these have head they have a tail and they actually attach to the surface of the bacteria they are also very specific so it's not like uh, any bacteriophage will infect any bacteria and you will kill bacteria so for example, the animal viruses, uh, they have, uh, it's called cell tropism or tissue tropism. So they are very specific for a particular cell, particular tissue and a particular organism. Um, similarly, bacteriophages, they're also specific for uh, the bacteria they infect. So in general, these viruses, they fall into two categories. Uh, they can be non-enveloped or enveloped. So what is the difference between non-enveloped and enveloped viruses? So in the non enveloped viruses, there is no membrane component, there is no envelope. So in this, uh, these are also called naked viruses. So there is the genome and genome is actually encapsulated by the capsid protein, that is the protein shell. And there is no membrane component in these uh, non enveloped viruses. Whereas we also have enveloped viruses. So these enveloped viruses, they have the genome, they have this nucleocapsid, the capsid coating the genome. And then outside this, there is this envelope, which is made up of, uh, there's this envelope. This envelope is made up of host derived membrane. So there is this membrane co component here. And in the membrane, you can see uh, there are these glycoproteins, which are decorated uh, and they have transmembrane, uh, uh, portion through which they are associated with the uh, uh, virus membrane. Um, looking here of uh, envelope viruses, we have coronaviruses. So these fall into the envelope viruses. And then we have flaviviruses, which also uh, fall into envelope viruses. So within the uh, envelope, the nucleocapsid can be of different, uh, it can have a different structure. So it can have a polyhedral shape or it can have a helical shape. So if we talk about SARS-CoV-2 or coronaviruses, you uh, the genome is actually and the nucleocapsid packs around the genome in the form of a helical structure. Whereas in the dengue uh, viruses that we commonly hear during the monsoon season in India or the chikungunya virus, inside uh, you have the uh, uh, the nucleocapsid actually looks like a polyhedron, but from outside it looks like a spherical uh, ball. And then on the surface, all these glycoproteins are decorated, uh, which are important for binding to the receptor. So when we look at the size of these viruses, there is, uh, you can see um, from 70 nanometer, it can range to 1000 nanometer. If we look here, there are some viruses which are called giant viruses. They are almost, I think, uh, there are four families of these giant viruses. And they are they have been some of these recently discovered. Um, so if we look at the size of the bacterium as compared to bacterium, uh, we have this Pandora virus, which is approximately 1,000 nanometer. Mimi virus, again, a giant virus, approximately 400 to 500 nanometer. Whereas if we look at HIV or if we look at flu viruses, they are in the range of um, uh, like seven, 70 to 100 nanometer range, a very small size. And then we have some viruses which are even smaller than this. As you can see here, there are some viruses which fall in the range of 17, 28, 30, 30 nanometer. Polio virus is very small uh, size virus, which is 30 nanometer. So they have various uh, sizes. Uh, so why it is important to study viruses? So 
as now we know they can lead to uh, global economic loss lead to epidemics and uh, pandemics uh, in the history and recent recently we have seen that this coronavirus uh, led to pandemic and then uh, there are other infectious diseases like bacterial infections which can cause epidemic and pandemic but viruses are also uh, very important from this point of view and if we look at the history there have been a lot of uh, few pandemics and epidemics outbreaks um, that have been important so we know about smallpox we know about spanish flu which is thought to lead to almost uh, 40 to 50 million death and now we have this covid 19 uh, almost uh, uh, almost 2 million 1.8 million deaths uh, have been caused due to this so these viruses uh, unlike bacteria the viruses um, if there was a epidemic pandemic maybe few decades uh, back it can re-emerge it can hide in some of its reservoirs and animals and it, it can reoccur and it can again cause uh, you know the outbreaks uh, because they change the genome change the proteins change so it's very important to study these viruses and also um, you know uh, be ready with the countermeasures in case there's an outbreak uh, the country uh, nation should be ready to uh, you know handle the outbreak and then uh, because of the uh, advancement um, or the uh, interaction with the animals there are more case cases of you know the animal the virus jumping from animal to the humans because there are more close contact of uh, humans with the animals nowadays as compared to you know few years back or uh, decades few decades back so moving on to in general how do these viruses uh, they cause infection or they actually infect the host cell so virus lying on a table it is just lying there it is not going to replicate by itself so it requires a cell in which a host cell it is called host cell in which it can go inside and then make many many copies of itself so there is a virus this is envelope virus and it is decorated with the envelope protein so these proteins uh, in corona these are called spike protein it has so it cannot infect any cell so the cells which will have a specific receptor for this particular virus so it will bind to these receptors and then it will uh, with the process uh, called endocytosis uh, receptor mediated endocytosis these viruses are actually taken inside the host cell so in the endosomes there is a change of ph as a result of which uh, conformational changes occur in the uh, proteins that are present on the surface of virus and the membrane of the virus then fuses with the membrane of the endosome and as a result uh, the genome is released in the cytoplasm and this, depending on what kind of genome it is, which virus it is, um, it can replicate in the cytoplasm or it can go to the nucleus of the host cell, it can get integrated into the nucleus and once it has done that then the main aim of the virus is to make many many copies of its genome or its protein and package into new virus particles and then these virus particles from this one infected cells it release number hundreds of virus particles which go and infect the nearby cells and this is how the infection happens so the entire life cycle involves a complex interaction and involvement of host and viral protein so virus has very less very specific proteins so uh, you by uh, only by its own protein it cannot replicate so the virus once it is inside the host cell it uses the uh, machinery or the proteins of the cell for example the ribosomes the protein synthesis machinery to make its own you know to replicate this genome and to make its protein so moving on to further so what are the various modes of transmission of these viruses so uh, the mode of transmission it can be direct it can be indirect so with direct there is a you uh, the person has to be in direct contact with the uh, infected person or it can be indirect it can be airborne it can be vector borne it can be mechanical it can be biological so uh, the main is to uh, if you see here uh, there are various ways by these uh, how these viruses are uh, transmitted so our skin is very protective it does not allow any of these viruses to enter so but if there is a cut or through needle use of needle 
um, these viruses or through injury, these viruses can be introduced into our body and then they go to the bloodstream and then they go to the specific uh, tissue where uh, they cause infection and that's how they replicate and uh, through animals or through sexual transmission or uh, what exactly we are eating that can be actually contaminated with the virus. So if one has to, uh, you know, avoid any viral infection, one has to take care of the things that you do not come in direct contact, um, you know, take precautions so that you do not come in direct contact with, you know, people or things that are infected. Um, indirect, it's very difficult, but obviously the hygienes are very important. You have to be very hygienic, wash your hands and things, you know, to, uh, avoid viruses so what about the treatments that are available for viral infections so uh, before the infection happens uh, we can take some preventive uh, follow preventive strategies for example there are vaccines that are available for some of the viral diseases but not for all and it's not very easy to make vaccines and then there uh, there is something which is called antibody based therapies that are available for some but not for all the viral diseases uh, there is research going on for antibody uh, so this field antibody uh, based therapies is gaining uh, uh, is being you know developed nowadays against number of uh, diseases not only viral diseases and then there are these antiviral drug or molecules where you can take tablet in case there is already infection and you want to now remove the viral infection or the virus from your body uh, then one has to take these uh, antiviral drugs which can help uh, the person taking the medicine to remove the viral infection when we talk about vaccines today it's not about vaccines it's more about antiviral drugs so there are various kinds of vaccines that are available for uh, you know in the market for various uh, viral diseases um, when we talk about antiviral drugs so these are actually molecules and these molecules generally uh, what is be has been uh, followed in the past is mostly targeting the function of the uh, virus one of the step of virus replication or one of the proteins or enzymes of the virus is actually targeted or inhibited by these antiviral agents so uh, very common uh, antiviral targets that are there in the virus genome or the virus proteins these are the polymerases that are present which replicate the genome rna to rna or from dna to rna and then we have these very proteases so virus specific proteases are there which are very important for the life cycle of the virus they are very essential for the virus so any molecule which kills the activity of the protease will also kill the virus the virus will not be able to replicate then some viruses they have integrase which helps uh, the genome to integrate into the host genome. So those are being targeted. Neuraminidase is being targeted. When you talk about polymerase, depending on which virus it is, these polymerases can be DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So for example, in coronavirus, chikungunya, dengue, all these are plus-strand RNA viruses. So they contain RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That means, the, this polymerase will use RNA and will make RNA from RNA. So for their polymerase activity, they are dependent on uh, the RNA as a template and then they make RNA. Uh, talking about, uh, uh, so there are these agents, as I mentioned in my previous slide, uh, that viruses, they require host. Uh, some of the host proteins are very essential for virus replication. So uh, nowadays, people are previously also uh, uh, the scientists, they actually try and target the cellular proteins or function or a synthetic pathway, which is very, very important for the replication of the virus. For example, one of the research projects that we are doing in our lab is we are targeting polyamine synthetic pathway. So polyamines are synthesized in the host cell and are very important for virus replication. So if we target any of the enzymes of polyamine pathway, we can actually inhibit the uh, virus replication. So moving on further, uh, when we talk about um, antiviral molecules that are presently few are in the market, uh, not very effective or they have some side effects, 
but number of these uh, especially the drug repurposing is being done and uh, these are being developed as antiviral therapeutics for uh, SARS-CoV-2 so there's a big list of molecules which have if we look at the research papers they have been tested against the um, SARS-CoV-2 in, in vitro uh, cell-based assay or in the in vivo model and seems to be effective killing the virus. Uh, so, uh, the clinical trials for some of these are pending. Um, so there's, they are being developed. So we'll come to the cycle later on and I will be discussing into more details what are the various steps where these uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 can be targeted. So how do how to study viruses? So we cannot just start thinking of using a drug or a vaccine against the virus. We have to understand how the virus is actually entering the host cell, how the virus is actually replicating inside the host cell, what are the essential steps that are involved uh, in virus life cycle uh, that lead to replication of the virus, making more genome and proteins and uh, budding. So to understand the complete mechanism, once we understand, then only we can actually uh, think of uh, identifying antiviral drug molecules or therapies against the virus. Uh, and one field is structural biology has been very helpful in uh, even in SARS-CoV-2 for identifying drugs. A lot of work is being done. So to study viruses, what are the basic uh, biochemical, biophysical, virology techniques that are used uh, to study these viruses? So now we know, uh, like from Corona, everyone is giving RT-PCR. So PCR is very important, molecular biology technique. Then we have cell culture. So what we do for viruses, um, if we want to make more virus, because we have to study this virus using some immunology technique or some structural technique, we have to make a lot of this virus. So how do we make this virus? So we take uh, cell lines which are susceptible to that particular virus. When we say susceptible, that means these cell lines should have a receptor for that virus. So we actually culture these cell lines in various kinds of uh, plastic wells that, are, that you can see here. And then once the cells are growing, we put that virus, the sample which contains that virus onto this. This virus will infect those cells. And once it is inside these cells, which are you know uh, growing in these uh, uh, plasticware, um, they will infect and they make a lot of virus. So when you have a lot of virus, you can purify the virus, or you can do all the uh, biochemical work that you want to do on the enzymes of these viruses. It is now inside the host cell, and these enzymes are being made. Uh, a lot of ELISA-based techniques are used for especially diagnostic. If you have purified a virus, you want to confirm the virus is right. So you will do a Western blot or you will do ELISA to figure out the virus has been purified, not purified. Uh, we also, uh, the virologists also work on viral proteins. So they recommendedly make the various enzymes of the virus, proteins of the virus, do a lot of protein biochemistry on these viral enzymes, viral proteins, and uh, um, then you have to see if proteins have been purified, not purified by various techniques, by spectrophotometric based techniques. You can run the purified samples of the virus or of the enzymes on SDS page. And then you can further do a Western to confirm which protein it is. Once you have pure virus or a pure protein, these samples, they are then further used for doing structural studies. Uh, they can be used, so when we talk about structural techniques that are available to study the structure. So uh, like humans, we have uh, eyes, mouth, hand. So if we want to block, let's say um, there is a virus which looks like a human and we want to block it, so we can put something in the mouth so that the virus is not able to eat. So how do we know exactly? These are submicroscopic. So we need a technique to see how the virus looks like. Where is its mouth? How can it be blocked? So we need techniques. So the techniques, it's more of a biophysics. Physics and biology involved together to look at this uh, structure of these viruses or proteins at the atomic level. So uh, a technique called uh, electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy, or cryo-electron microsco microscopy, you can actually look in the detail at the atomic level, how the proteins are arranged, 
how one protein interacting with the other protein all the details how amino acids are arranged you go at the atomic level there is also a technique which is called x-ray crystallography so in this you have to purify the protein in milligrams you have to make this protein form crystals that's why it's called crystallography like you have sugar crystals you have to make uh, crystals of virus or crystals of the protein um, there are methods to do that and once you have these crystals they are not solid like sugar crystals they are very fragile if you touch it they break so then you take these protein crystals you uh, put it in x-ray machine you bombard it with the x-rays because these molecules are arranged um, in a lattice so you get a diffraction pattern so x-rays are hitting onto these uh, crystals of protein or the virus and then uh, they get diffracted and you get a pattern so once you have this diffraction pattern using maths using Fourier transform using computational techniques um, you can actually go at the atomic level and see how the amino acids are forming a polypeptide and how this polypeptide is folding into the 3d structure and how the structure of the virus or the protein looks like and then there are techniques uh, there's this uh, nuclear magnetic nmr it has its own limitation and then there's in case we are not able to make crystals or in case we don't have the protein purified protein there are bioinformatic uh, techniques or tools that are available by which one can predict the structure based on what is available in the database uh, protein uh, um, uh, structure database is there um, so computationally one can go and look at the structures of these and then whatever research or work you want to do one can do so talking about electron microscopy uh, earlier uh, now there has been a development and in electron microscopy field and now we have cryo electron microscopy and tomo uh, tomography however uh, a few years back uh, initially when electron microscopy started for viruses one was using actually the transmission electron microscopy um, so the electron beam when it falls onto the sample a uh, lot of uh, heat is generated they can get actually uh, um, the sample can, can get destroyed um, so uh, they were actually and a very good contrast is not uh, seen so one has to do negative staining they have to stain the sample uh, with the electron dense material so that the once the elect, uh, electron or the electron being formed they when they get diffracted they can be actually imaged easily contrast can be seen um, and then however the resolution initially when the technique started um, it was not very good it was like around 20 to 40 angstrom but later on with the development of the electron microscope itself and uh, the methodology to solve and later on so the resolution and the detector everything has improved so now the resolution is much better with cryo it is further better because cryo you freeze the sample it does not actually spoil the sample you get better images so these are some just showing the slide is showing here uh, the various viruses how they look under the transmission electron microscope so you have adenovirus you have hepatitis b virus you have uh, paramyxovirus and then you this is how the polyvirus particles uh, look like so moving on to electron microscopy um, i talked about cryo electron microscopy transmission electron microscopy you get the images look like this for the cryo electron microscopy you can do single particle purify and then do a 3d reconstruction and you can go to the atomic uh, resolution can be uh, very good high level and you can go to details of how amino acids are arranged in the surface protein of a virus or inside the virus uh, one can do electron tomography uh, if i go into this uh, we have to really spend a lot of time so i'll skip electron tomography and electron but there are these techniques structural techniques which are you used for uh, studying viruses and viral proteins so moving on further uh, these slides are just showing this was the first structure of tomato bushy stunt virus which was solved by x-ray crystallography in 1978 at two angstrom 
moving on to the further uh, when we talk about resolution so if we say resolution is very good as you can see using x-ray crystallography this is a structure of uh, polio virus done in 1985 at 2.9 ekstrom you can see the details here however at that time now uh, we have better so cryo structures were done at 20 angstrom and you do not see all the details of you miss that out if the resolution is not good uh, these are some of these structures. Uh, this is dengue virus structures. Uh, 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 we do the structure, not we. This was done uh, at Purdue University by Richard Kuhn. So one can do the structures of these viruses uh, bound to receptor, bound to uh, the antibodies, or at various pH. You can see how the virus conformation is changing when you change the pH, when you change the temperature. So a lot of work is done using structural biology to study viruses. Uh, this was the structure of Zika virus uh, that was done using cryo electron microscopy, but the resolution was nowadays is much better than it was 25, 30 years back. Uh, moving on to further. So uh, when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, uh, that's the topic of today. Um, if we go to the protein database uh, and if we look at the structure, the virus structure is available. Along with that, uh, this slide here is showing the various uh, structures of SARS-CoV-T proteins that are available in the database. So we have structures of NSP12, NSP13, 14, 16, spike protein, nucleocapsid protein, and NSP3, that is the protease, and even for the MPRO, the other protease, 3CL protease, all these are available in the structure database. So uh, using structure-based uh, drug discovery, we can use the structures of these protein and using computational uh, techniques or programs, one can do screening of uh, molecules which can potentially bind to these uh, structures. And that's what uh, we do here at IIT Ruki uh, in our lab. So um, good thing uh, that really helped um, to work on to handle COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 was that previously, in the previous years, there have been outbreak of coronaviruses, human coronaviruses. So these three uh, SARS-CoV-2, MERS-CoV-2, and SARS-CoV-2, uh, these are highly pathogenic viruses of uh, coronaviruses of humans. Um, before the SARS-CoV-2 happened in 2002-2003, there was this outbreak of SARS-CoV-2, 2012. So uh, there were labs in the world, there was data available in the database for some of the important proteins and viruses, their genome and things good amount of research was already done. So that really helped uh, the world or the virologist or the scientist to actually handle SARS-CoV-2, come up with vaccine very quickly. People knew how to culture, had some idea about this virus based on SARS-CoV-2 uh, that did uh, cause an outbreak in 2002. So uh, whatever uh, literature or uh, the structures and virus information that is available in literature or in the data database actually helps or helped in SARS-CoV-2. So when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, uh, this is the this is enveloped virus and it actually was a it's a problem for the whole world, not specifically for developed or undeveloped countries. Uh, the virus is transmitted, uh, this disease transmitted by SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19. This is positive sing, uh, sense single stranded. That means if I take the genome of this RNA, I inject it into the host cell without the virus. I take the RNA, I put it inside, we can get virus out. So its genome is infectious. The genome, its positive sense means it can act like a messenger RNA. It can make uh, various proteins of the virus and replicate the genome and the virus, and you get the virus out. So we, we already know uh, things about corona, so I'll skip this slide, and I will move further. Um, still, it's a problem. A lot of variants are coming up, and we do hear a few deaths, especially in elderly, immunocompromised, 
of the new variants even they are vaccinated still uh, it is problem for few here so looking at the life cycle of sars cov2 here so the uh, virus enters the host cell through receptor mediated endocytosis ace2 is the receptor the protein s protein on the surface uh, it interacts with the receptor and the uh, virus goes inside the genome is released the genome is then uh, uh, translated into viral proteins which replicate the genome and uh, the genome plus from minus minus to plus all viral proteins are made um, the viral proteins uh, n protein interacts with the uh, genome it um, forms the nucleo uh, the nucleocapsid um, and then it interacts with the envelope protein and the virus buds out so this is the genome of organization of SARS-CoV-2. It's a big size RNA and the um, it codes for non-structural proteins that is the uh, enzymes of the virus. So looking at this uh, life cycle of SARS-CoV-2, there are various uh, ways by which we can target and we can identify antiviral molecules. So uh, these proteins of the virus they are produced as polyproteins so they need to be processed by viral protease so one can actually stop the processing of viral protein by targeting the protease of the virus one can target the replication of the genome or one can actually um, this um, one can actually target the entry of the virus by identifying molecules which can inhibit the interaction of the virus with the receptor for example neutralizing antibodies are there and then virus has to bud out so even the budding can be targeted so the various proteins that are good potential antiviral targets in SARS-CoV-2 we have the structural proteins present in the virus particles and these are the proteins uh, which are produced in the infectious cell which help in replicating the virus so uh, the strategy that we are following here so what happens for example there is a viral disease and there is one antiviral drug which is targeting one of the virus specific protein uh, of the virus and the the uh, the disease or the infection um, gets over and uh, so what happens these viruses they can actually mutate so if there is only one drug against one target there are chances that the virus can actually um, mutate that protein can mutate and this drug which is there in the market against that specific viral protein um, that may become uh, not effective uh, against uh, the uh, mutated uh, virus which has the mutation in that specific target so the strategy that we are taking here is take one molecule drug a small molecule and it instead of targeting just one protein it can target number of proteins so in case even if there is a mutation in one protein this drug is targeting the other virus specific proteins still it will be effective so that's the strategy that we uh, came up with and we thought about it so what we found based on the structure these um, sars cov2 proteins 12 13 14 15 16 and the nucleocapsid the structures are available based on structure when we analyze and based on literature we know that all these proteins they bind to nucleotides so there's a pocket in these proteins to which uh, the nucleotide bind and this binding pocket is conserved and very important for the function of these proteins so what we thought why not identify one molecule which actually can bind to this pocket of all these proteins and that's how it will block the uh, interaction of this protein with its substrate that is the nucleotide so we identified where exactly based on structure is this pocket where this nucleotide is actually binding and then using uh, in silico work we are trying to identify what molecule binds here so the flow that we have here uh, based on so just not doing one structure taking all these structures uh, we do virtual screening of drug libraries we identify molecules molecules that are identified are purchased proteins are made and then biophysically we do experiment to confirm the molecule that we have identified from the database actually it binds uh, it is binding to the target that we are thinking if we find it is binding and we do biochemical assays to see if it is inhibiting that protein that we uh, that's the target 
then we further go into cell based assay on the virus to see if virus is being inhibited or not so uh, uh, we have the structure we have the compound libraries using various computational to uh, tools of uh, virtual screening uh, we screen these compound libraries out of um, 100 to thousands or 100000 molecules we uh, come narrow down to few molecules which can potentially bind to the pocket of these target proteins not one protein but number of proteins we are take, uh, taking so we will know exactly uh, where this uh, drug or the potential antiviral molecule is binding in the pocket and then using various computational tool we can actually analyze and see where this drug molecule is binding and which amino acids are involved in binding to this drug molecule so when we do uh, when we do uh, virtual screening we form a grid and we tell this is the in the whole protein this is the area uh, where the nucleotide binds and we want our inhibitors to bind to this target and that's how we identify and uh, we find so what we have done we took one fda approved drug library and we took all these protein, NSP12, 13, uh, NSP14, 15, 16, and then we did screening against the FDA approved drug library and we identified these three compounds which have binding energy, which bind to this pocket, uh, nucleotide binding pocket at a higher binding energy as compared to the nucleotide itself because it has to compete, the binding has to be better. So uh, we did FDA approved and we have identified based on the screening, um, these three molecules. Uh, we, another library that we screened was LOPAC drug, li uh, drug library. And from this drug library, again, these molecules that are listed here, all these three, they bind to all these six molecules better than the nucleotide, the substrate here. And then another uh, library that we screened is natural product drug library. And from here also, these are the molecules, three molecules that we have identified from the drug library, which binds to all these uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Uh, so overall, we have identified nine molecules here, which actually from different drug libraries um, that actually bind and target, not just one, they're multi-target um, of SARS-CoV-2 virus specific protein. So next is to, uh, we have these molecules. Now we want to validate our computational uh, work. Is it actually binding or not binding? So we need the protein and do experiments, biochemical, biophysical, to confirm that it is binding. So just to uh, do that, we uh, purified the protein using basic recombinant DNA technology. We are making these proteins in bacteria or in yeast or in bacula virus. We purify these proteins and then uh, using SDS page, we confirm that protein is so here. The gel is for the end protein that is the uh, nucleocapsid protein, one of the domain of SARS-CoV-2. The protein was purified. This protein was used for uh, biochemical, biophysical work. So then we did isothermal calorimetry studies to confirm and find how strongly these molecules that we have identified, the names of the molecules are given here. These are the nine molecules from three different drug libraries to confirm that are they actually binding to the target that is the end protein here. And we found this is actually uh, validating experimentally the computational work that they actually bind to this molecule. Uh, further, uh, once we... Uh, these molecules, we know now they're binding to the target protein. We want to see if they actually inhibit the virus or not. So we culture the virus and then uh, we put the compound um, along with the virus on the cells. We should not see any virus coming out of these infected cells. Uh, one can do plaque assay, little bit virology is here. So we, we can tighter or figure out how much amount of virus is present in presence of these antiviral molecules and without. So without, there should be more virus. And in presence of these drugs, there should be no virus or very less virus. So we can quantify. We can quantify by RT-PCR. Uh, these drugs, as they are repurposed drugs, they are already being used for some other, uh, you know, they are in the market or potentially in the um, clinical trial for some diseases. So one has to still do uh, to see if these are cytotoxic or not. So with help of um, 
we do not have BSL three right now, so we took help uh, of our collaborator in Sweden, Karolinska Institute, and we did the in vitro antiviral efficacy. We tested how uh, efficient they are. So if you look at the data here uh, for one of the molecules. Um, um, this is the blue one is the inhibition. This is the cytotoxicity. So these are the concentrations of the drug and you can see uh, this is 50%. So even at 25 micromolar, the drug actually till 12.5, it is almost less than um, 80%, uh, very less, not toxic. So uh, for doing antiviral inhibition, uh, we use these concentrations and uh, we found uh, that at 6.25 micromolar, this particular drug is actually inhibiting the virus almost 50%. Similarly, we tested the other drugs um, and then we found um, that these drugs, as you can see this one, uh, at very low, this is 6.25 micromolar, at very low concentration, low micromolar, almost in nanomolar range, it is actually uh, inhibiting SARS-CoV-2. We also did, uh, this is the plaque forming units and this is the drug and these are actually the uh, amount of drug that was used. So between five to 10, we see a good reduction in the virus titer in plaque assays. So this clearly shows uh, that these three drugs from uh, the FDA approved from natural and from uh, uh, the LOPAC, uh, these have actually good antiviral potential and they actually uh, can uh, target, uh, can be further developed and used after in vivo and clinical trials for uh, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, looking at the EC50 and CC50 and uh, SI uh, index, um, so EC50, um, you can see for these molecules is, uh, and this is the cytotoxicity, this is the uh, inhibitory activity. So uh, for this one, actually it is at a very low micromolar range, so which was very good and we were very excited uh, to find these molecules. These can be again repurposed and used for corona treatment in future. Uh, the next, what we are doing here is, um, we have purified the protein. We have these drug molecules. We are using X-ray crystallography. Uh, we can crystallize the protein uh, in presence of these uh, drug bound to it. So um, take protein, take, uh, take these molecules, make the crystals. The protein is bound to the drug, get, uh, get the diffraction uh, data. And then uh, one can look at the electron density, detail amino acids. And in the 3D structure, we can confirm and we can figure out, like in silico, we are predicting that it is binding like this. But in actual, experimentally, if we find this drug is actually binding here, so based on the structure available of a common one can make this, pro uh, this drug molecule further more effective by adding various uh, chemical moieties. Structurally, we can see and, um, uh, you know, so that's what we are planning. So we have, uh, uh, we already have, it's the data, the work that I showed here is all unpublished. Um, this one, we have two drugs, which are actually binding to the end protein. We have cl collected X-ray um, uh, data and in future soon, uh, we'll be, you know, trying to modify and make it more effective and we'll be doing in vivo studies for this. So to summarize here, uh, for today's talk, uh, what uh, we, so we have targeted uh, these number of proteins from SARS-CoV-2, NSP-12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and protein of, uh, and uh, we are doing drug repurposing because if we have a new molecule, we have to do toxicity studies, animal studies, drug repurposing, uh, the medicine or the molecule can, um, you know, quickly come into the market against a particular disease. So we did drug repurposing. Uh, we screened uh, three libraries in silico identified molecules. Uh, we took these molecules and biochemically, biophysically, 
we have validated that these molecules are actually binding to the target. Uh, then we did in vitro assessment of uh, the antivirally, and we have uh, these three molecules that are listed here. These three are effective in micromolar range, uh, low micromolar range against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we have co-crystallized two of these with the N protein, and in future we'll be doing uh, it's ongoing right now, the in vivo experiments to see if these drugs are also effective against the virus in the uh, mice model, as well as we are also trying to make them more potent by slightly modifying these molecules by adding some functional chemical moiety so that it binds stronger to the active site of these uh, target proteins. <clears throat> these are some of the references. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the uh, BST serve IFA project uh, that has funded this research that I presented today. Uh, I would also like to thank MCU, uh, our department, Biosciences, Bioengineering, IIT Roorkee for all the facilities and support that um, was given to us uh, during the Corona time. Uh, COVID time. Uh, we would like to thank BSL3 facility at Karolinska Institute Sweden for helping us in doing the um, virus work. And uh, in this project, we are collaborating with uh, Professor Gerald at Karolinska and then Professor Pravindra at IIT Roorkee uh, in the project. So thank you very much. I also thank my students. Uh, we, this work has been um, done by Ruchi, which is she's here, um, and then Ankur. Um, most of these students, they have these corona projects. And during the corona time, they were staying outside uh, the campus as PG, and they were working. They really worked hard. And I'm very thankful for all uh, to all my students uh, for the work that they do, hard work. Uh, thank you all. Now I can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Tomar. So I, I'll request those who has questions to raise their hands and, uh, you know, go ahead um, and ask their questions. In the meantime, I, I'm seeing a question in the chat box, uh, a question box. So I'll just uh, share it with you also. So that you can respond to it. Just a moment. Um. So we have got two questions now, one from Jayadev uh, Sharma. So Jayadev, would you like to uh, raise your, you know, ask the question directly? I'll unmute you. Please unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, I don't have mic. Okay, then I'll just paste the question to you. Is it possible to get out of? I'm sharing my this. So, uh, is it possible to get out, unshare my screen? Yes, you, can, you can stop sharing your screen. I'll, 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 or I'll change presenter. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jayadev uh, has asked which docking program was used for screening where the binding sites conserved across a variance and have we observed any patterns similarities during uh, uh, between the drugs uh, just a second, that were uh, bound to the multiple targets i'll also share this in chat with you so that you can read it Yeah, so for screening, we used Pyrex. And then we also did, uh, we used uh, Autodoc Vienna to, you know, confirm further. And uh, the next question was, where were binding sites conserved across variants? I'm not sure uh, this is like variants or so the enzymes, the variations or the variants that are occurring are mostly on the S protein. So in this project, uh, we don't have S protein. We have these um, 
viral non structural proteins and there is less variation seen and the pocket that we have considered here uh, we do not see the mutations in the pocket in the variants that are coming up so i hope that was the it was about the variants and uh, it was not about the conserved across various proteins so when we look at the pocket of these number of multi targets uh, the uh, pocket has some similarity obviously because it is binding all these pockets are binding to nucleotides so there are similarities and if we superimpose them uh, if there's a hydrophobic residue there's another hydrophobic residue at the same place but it's not exactly same so there is some conservation in these pockets and that's how i think uh, targeting the pocket with the same molecule have been possible so we did analyze initially to see it looks very similar and then we further moved on to have we observed any pattern similarities between the drugs that uh, were bind to the multi target uh, similarities between the drug uh, not very high similarity i would say uh, pattern also we did try to analyze and see how one molecule is binding to there is some variation but when we look at the hydrogen bond donor acceptor there is some similarity but i won't say like 100% it's very similar yeah so i hope i've answered uh, the questions um, thank you i hope uh, that answers the question if there is any uh, more doubts please uh, type it below and uh, i also see another question from aditya uh, so would you like to ask the question or i've unmuted you and in the meantime i'll send the question to dr tomar yes please how was the binding of screen molecules determined to be better than the natural substrate nucleotide so we looked at the binding energy that's how we selected the top compounds and from the top compounds also we actually uh, visualized and looked at how the molecules are binding so one basis was the binding energy uh, these scores and then uh, there were some molecules which were not made, making the right contact or was slightly away from the pocket shifted some molecules so we did based on our own analysis as well as the binding energy more than the nucleotide binding that's how we selected these compounds uh, based on dna protein docking uh, be delta g yeah right were the experimentally determined binding energy values for the nucleotide structure known what the experimentally determined binding energy values of the nucleotide substrate known uh, no so some structures that are available they already have a nucleotide bound to it so we know exactly we know for sure that it actually binds here so we ourselves docked the nucleotides into the pocket and also the compounds and that's how so we wanted to be sure uh, we did the docking ourselves of the nucleotide and do the calculation of all these binding energies and things just to make sure uh, the same program is used and same way uh, the binding energy is analyzed for the compounds and the substrate the nucleotide that's how uh, we did it okay so th thanks for the answer uh, next i see R R dr ratan chand three with the hand up so i am i have unmuted can you ask the question ratan chaudhary you have your hand up so okay if if there are no questions then we will take a you know a short break and come back uh, in some time and uh, please feel free to uh, type in your questions even now if you have any sure. questions then we can take it up at that hello yes yes sir am i audible yes, yes. oh sorry. thank you um thank you it was a wonderful talk uh, dr tomar uh my question is uh, um uh, somewhere in your presentation you said 
uh, that uh, some cell line that a specific cell line that is a receptor um, yes. that allow the virus to grow right, right, uh, right. In, in some yes uh, so some in some of the paper i'm not sure if i'm like right, asking the correct question in some of the paper they say uh, they are using stem cell to grow the viruses so what's the peculiar about those stem cells uh, that uh, allow many viruses to grow in comparison to the differentiated cell which doesn't allow them to grow can you say something on on that yeah so uh, if stem cells if we uh, there are some viruses which not only utilize one specific receptor uh, they have mm -hmm. more than one receptor or a co-receptor or through like heparin these uh, viruses they immobilize or they kind of stick to these cells and then um, uh, they find the receptor or a co-receptor and which helps in the entry of these uh, viruses. So uh, I am not very sure which virus exactly uh, you are talking about. And so there is possible that the virus has uh, not just one specific receptor, but broad receptors and uh, then it will be easy so to this you know uh, use stem cells that's what i can think of uh, right now but maybe there is some other mechanism uh, that stem cells uses if anything sticks to it it goes in by some process that's quite possible i'm not sure um, about that i hope uh, i've been able to you know answer your query yeah i hope that answers your question dr Atan. uh now i don't i'll just check for last minute questions no there are no more questions at present so anybody who has uh, any other queries can of course reach out to us later post uh, this session also before we move on to the next session where we will talk about the funding opportunities that are available for different stages of researchers and um, in science uh, we would like to take a short break from uh, from the program so i'll uh, it's 11 uh, it's 10:45 now i'll request you all to be back by uh, 10.50. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hope uh, you all are back from uh, the short break. And now we move to another important session uh, on the funding opportunities at India Alliance. This session will be taken by uh, Ms. Isha Goel. Isha is a nanobiotechnology engineer possessing MTech in nanotechnology from IIT Roorkee and BTech in biotechnology from MIT Noida. She has ardent research experience, especially in the biomedical uh, domain, which uh, translated into a patent for burn wound healing patch. She has worked as a project executive in biotechnology firms in Delhi, where she was part of the management team for National Plant Tissue Culture Certification System training program for African candidates and setup of new ventures. Currently, she is a grants advisor at India Alliance, and today she will talk about the grants and fellowships uh, available at India Alliance and how you can apply for them. So I hand the screen over to Isha uh, with this. Thanks. Thank you, Namashri. Uh, good morning, everyone. Give me a moment. I'll just share my screen. Uh, is my presentation visible, Himishri? Yes, yes, it's clear. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, 
good morning everyone so i will be taking you through the various fund, uh, funding opportunities that india alliance brings to you all so starting with india alliance is a, a public charity that funds research in health and biomedical sciences in india and um, we are funded by the department of biotechnology government of india and the welcome trust uk so since our launch in 2008 we have worked towards supporting research ecosystems to improve human and animal health and well being uh, in 2008 we have successfully since 2008 we have successfully started the fellowship based programs in the basic biomedical research and in 2013 the clinical and public health research fellowships were launched in the second phase uh, india alliance uh, launched new grants to support clinical and public health research centers and team science grants so we'll be going through all these programs sequentially in this presentation this slide shows the pan india reach of india alliance uh, you can see the various uh, individuals and institutions that we have funded across india Uh, accounting for 537 awards in 133 organizations across 47 cities moving ahead we will now uh, first go through the fellowship programs uh, of india uh, india alliance uh, basically the basic biomedical fellowships and the clinical and public health fellowships our fellowships are very attractive with built in features in india alliance fellowships more emphasis is on the lead investigator no bar on age. there is no bar on age or nationality we give due regard to non research career breaks provided they are properly justified in the applications so a career break in research for example due to unprecedented pandemic or maternity reasons is given due regard during the assessment of the preliminary applications a salary position or commitment towards a position is not a requirement for our fellowships we have an online user friendly application process through the iss portal we encourage fellows to pursue interdisciplinary research and our awardees have provisions to develop international collaborations uh the selected applications go through international peer review where applicants receive insights and suggestions for their proposals that they have submitted to india alliance this peer review is very helpful for their future development and the most important feature is that the quantum of funding that india alliance provides is generous and the fellows have a lot of flexibility of on how they can utilize the awarded funds moving ahead the fellowship our fellowships provide funding for individual scientists at various stage in their career the in early career fellowships the intermediate fellowships and the senior fellowships early career fellowships are designed for talented newly qualified phd's and post doctoral researchers to attain independence intermediate fellowships are for researchers who wish to establish an inter, in, independent laboratory another thing that the intermediate fellowship is able to achieve is that it brings researchers from abroad to the indian scientific research fold by providing the which is due to the generous funding and the flexibility that india alliance gives and the senior fellowships are for more established researchers who have demonstrated their ability to lead an independent research project and group and want to expand their research program in india all three fellowships are available for both the basic biomedical research re researchers and as well as the clinicians and public health workers you may access uh, information related to all schemes on our official website uh coming to the important aspects of each of our fellowship schemes uh these are the key provisions that uh, are basic biomedical Fellow schemes have 
So under the basic biomedical scheme, the early career fellowship is a mentored fellowship. To foster independence, early career fellows are strongly encouraged to carry out their fellowship project in a laboratory that is different from their thesis environment. We need, we uh, promote independence in their research. So this is a requirement for the early, early career fellows. Eligibility for ECF is, uh, ECF is early career fellowship is from for last year of PhD to four, four, four years post PhD or an equivalent degree. This competition occurs once every year. Senior and intermediate fellowship category, that is the SIF category. This com competition is held together for senior and intermediate. And this competition is open to researchers with four to 15 years of post PhD or an equivalent degree experience. Applicants choose the scheme most appropriate for them based on their qualification and their career trajectory. The senior and intermediate competition runs twice a year. As I said earlier, these are very generous uh, fellowships and have a budget of 1.7 crore for early career fellows and for intermediate 3.6 crores and senior 4.5 crores for the duration of five years. Salary uh is an is it is included in the in this budget fellows are provided with salary support set by india alliance for each scheme in case a fellow receives a salary from their host institution a top up is provided so as to meet the salary level set for each category the fellowship can also be used to purchase equipment through fund requests for expensive though uh, fund requests for expensive equipment need to be are typically not allowed for early career fellows. It is expected that the applicant will choose uh, an appropriate laboratory or environment where the majority of the necessary equipment and facilities are already provided for. For intermediate and senior fellows, there is no such restrictions. Major equipment can be asked for on the budget. There is also the provision of hiring support staff. Uh, ECF can uh, request for only one technical support staff and that too not in the first year of their fellowship. Whereas intermediate and fellows can request for up to two and senior for up to four support staff, including PhD students and postdocs. Work, work outside host institution is a a uh, major feature of our fellowship. Uh, work outside host institution is also called VOHI. And like mentioned earlier, one of the coveted provisions of our fellowship. And as the fellows can carry out a part of their work at different lab outside of their host institution. This can be in India or abroad. For working abroad, fellows will be provided with an allowance of $3,000 per month based on the prevailing conversion rate. ECF can visit a lab uh, outside their host institution for up to two years, while intermediate fellows can av avail VOHI for up to one year. VOHI option is not available for senior fellows, but they may request for funds for travel and subsistence costs for short visits to the collaborators. In addition, for travel to conference meetings or visit collaborators lab for short visits, we provide up to 7.5 lakhs for five years for early and intermediate and up to 10 lakhs for five years for seniors as travel allowance. Finally, contingency funds are provided as India Alliance recognizes the unanticipated cost might arise during the tenure of the project. Therefore, in addition to the requested cost, the India Alliance will provide contingency funds to cover such expenses, which is 2.5 lakhs for early, 7.5 and 10 lakhs for intermediate and senior respectively. So these are the basic aspects of our basic biomedical science fellowships. 
moving on to clinical and public health schemes so here all our uh, i'll quickly point out the main differences in the cps scheme compared to the biomedical scheme of course the eligibility requirement is broadened to include those with md masters in public health and phd's as clinicians and public health researchers often have very different career trajectories compared to basic biomedical scientists our eligibility also takes that into consideration and is more flexible in terms of length of research experience which you can see from the 15 years eligibility window applicants can choose the scheme most appropriate for them based on their qualification research experience career trajectory and track record the salary cap and budget cap is also slightly higher for C uh, clinical and public health researchers mainly to compensate for their clinical practice since many clinical and public health research uh, schemes also require field workers etc the provision for support staff is also relaxed S subject to strong justification is required for the request for Uh, for support staff other provisions remain the same as that in the basic biomedical schemes coming to the application process to become an india lines fellow all our fellowship schemes require a preliminary application which includes applicant cv 750 word abstract of their proposal and recommendation letter at least one recommendation letter should be there based on this preliminary application we assess the eligibility and competitiveness in the cohort and then the full applications are invited full applications are accepted on invitation basis only the full application is more comprehensive with multiple sections that an applicant needs to fill out like it has more detailed proposal requires letters from all roles on the application it has a detailed budget etc then these full applications are sent out for peer review which is an important step of our application cycle the review feedback is shared with all applicants at the end regardless of the shortlisting decision to help them craft their future proposals based on the review feedback applications are shortlisted for interview by the selection committee then based on the assessment uh, in the interview applicants are chosen for award or declined this entire cycle takes up to 10 months and the important thing to note here is that once you submit a full application you cannot compete again in the same competition or a junior competition so if you have submitted a full application for intermediate fellowship you cannot apply again for early career or intermediate regardless of the decision you can however apply for senior fellowship going ahead so uh, you are you guys are at advice to keep an eye out for call for applications on our website and social media handles check eligibility and submit the application through the on, our online portal isis having covered the fellowships offered by india alliance in some detail i will now briefly talk about the new funding grant schemes the clinical and public health research centers and the team science grants team science grants fund team of researchers who bring together complementary skills knowledge and resources to address a important health health challenge in india these grants also fund high risk high reward research work the project work must be multi institutional and interdisciplinary in its approach a minimum of 3 investigators should participate including one as principal investigator who could manage and lead the team the applying team should bring different expertise or disciplines to address the research problem within the remit of india alliance no more than two investigators can be from one institution 
and a minimum of two institutions should be included in a team science grant application. We encourage to observe gender balance and geographical diversity in team composition. The funding is provided for up to 10 crores for a five year project where funds can be requested for staff, equipment, consumables, strengthening research management structure at the institution, etc. The clinical and public health research centers or CRCs are institutional grants that are meant to promote clinical and public health research and develop physician scientists. They would empower clinicians and public health scientists to carry out patient and population oriented research in addition to the patient care and preventive medicine. CRCs are envisioned to include more than one institution. A strong justic vacation would be required for a single institution CRC, in which case multiple departments at the institution should come together. Here also funding is provided for up to 10 crores for a five year project. Funds can be requested for hiring equipment, maintaining clinical and uh, population cohorts, training the early career clinicians and research, strength and research management structure, etc. This, uh, this uh, clinical and research training program aims to develop physician scientists as a way forward for improving clinical and public health research ecosystem in India. CRTP, Clinical Research Training Program, is, a, is not a standalone program. Uh, this is administered embedded between, uh, within the CRC or the Clinical and Public Health Research Centers, which we discussed in the previous slide. The program would fund this uh, clinical research training program will would fund three to four year mentored research training fellowships for medical graduates and postgraduates, MD, MS, or equivalent. For up to up to 12 fellowships will be available each year. The value of each fellowship will be around 50 lakhs. Only and this uh, budget of 50 lakhs only personal is only only includes the personal support of the fellow we launched uh, our new funding scheme irmi or the india management research initiative with the this is a new scheme and this it uh, it has a purpose to create robust research ecosystem in India to address global challenges. It aims to strengthen e uh, institutional ecosystems by facilitating research management systems through funding, training, and mentoring. IRMI initiative began, began in 2018 and is successfully uh, creating a community of research managers in India. IRMI offers funding opportunities for research managers through three types of competitions. First, to launch a research manager's career, research management fellowships are given out. Second, uh, to support the existing research management offices in India, uh, one year research management grants are given and third to provide networking opportunities to the research managers uh, six months research management travel grants are provided so that they they which they can use to travel to international conferences and meeting and build networks with this i come to an end of my presentation and would like to draw everyone's attention to the currently open IRMI application, uh, IRMI call, uh, which has a submission deadline of 18th October 2022. Other fellowships is, and grant schemes will be launched subsequently in to 2023. The tentative months of launch of fellowships have been uh, provided in this slide.
we request prospective applicants to visit our website for updated application call dates and deadlines. We frequently have webinars with in-depth description of the scheme and also our grantees speak about their journey in these webinars, which is an I, uh, a plethora of information that is provided in these webinars. Uh, these are available on, on our YouTube channel too. If interested, you must take a look. To know more about our various funding schemes, do look up our website and follow our social media handles. We, you will find a lot of interesting stuff there, like the external newsletters, Science Together podcast series, and the Science Stories video series. Write to us at info at the rate India Alliance if you have any doubts about your eligibility or, or the scheme provisions. We would be happy to help. With this, I would like to close my talk. Thank you for your time and attention. So I am open to I, any questions that you, uh, I anyone would have. Kimishri uh, has been disconnected. Uh, so my name is Abdul Rahman. I'll be taking ahead the last session. So right now uh, we are end with our today's events. Uh, what we would like to have is if you would want to ask any questions or address any concerns to, uh, of the talks and presentations, you can always write down into the question box or you can raise your hand. We will unmute you and uh, you can address your questions. I see, I see a question uh, from Aditya Sharma. Uh, what is the approximate gap between the preliminary application and the full application? So when the preliminary application is launched and like you submit a preliminary application, after that um, a full application is launched about in, in a month, four weeks to six weeks duration. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if you have any further questions, you can raise your hand or type them here itself. Another question, how was the binding of uh, uh, molecules determined to be better than the natural substrate nucleotide based on DNA uh, protein docking BE values, delta T, MM, TBCA calculations, or were the experiment experimentally determined finding energy values for the nucleotide substrate known. I think uh, this is a question for... Uh... Yeah. I don't... Participants can access their mic and they can ask their questions directly. Uh, all you need to do is turn on your mics and uh, you can question directly. Do we have any questions? Okay, I see a question. Is the funding transferable between labs? So uh, this would call we call it as uh, I hope by labs you mean the institutions, and uh, we have a feature of host institution transfer, but this requires a strong justification, and but this is possible and it can be processed. Uh, you can see the various aspects of this request on our website. Uh, it's available. And if you have any further concerns, you can write to us and we will guide you through that. Uh, and is the restriction of mentor or host lab only limited to PhD supervisor or to postdoc lab as well for ECF? Uh, we would uh, encourage uh, not to continue in a lab Restriction is mainly for PhD labs, the thesis labs, but we would encourage our uh, fellows or applicants to uh, move ahead from their uh, existing lab. And if they want to continue and have strong justifications, those will be considered as well for ACF. 
if you have any queries write to us at info at the rate india alliance and uh, you will receive a response with, within 3 days working days i don't see any other questions at the moment me neither if 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 anybody has any uh, questions you can always write down to us and we'll get back to you with that uh, uh, we thank you for joining and taking your uh, taking your time to attend this uh, workshop and we hope uh, this has been uh, uh, resourceful to you and uh, with the end of a uh, webinar uh, you'll be receiving a link uh, to submit a feedback kindly give us your valuable uh, evaluation so that we can send out the certificates and i thank you we thank, we thank uh, dr shaili tomar uh, dr vijay singh and uh, ms isha goel for uh, giving us a brief overview about funding opportunities and as well as structure assisted single molecule multi targeting of sars cov2 thank you everyone for joining in